after the introduction of gunpowder, the infantry soldiers' first weapons were the musket and rifle. In World War I, he used the bolt-action Springfield M1903, and in World War II, it was the superb, self-loading M1 Garand. Today, the American soldier carries the lightweight, selective-fire self-loading rifle, like the U.S. Army M16A2, used by these trainees at Fort Hunter in California. The M16A2 can be fired on single shot or in three round bursts, has a 30 round magazine and weighs eight and a half pounds loaded. The rifle is easy to carry, accurate over ranges of up to 400 yards and can kill or disable an enemy soldier. However, it is unsuitable against an area target like a platoon spread out in open country, or an enemy who has taken cover or dug into defensive positions. An even greater threat to the infantry is enemy tanks, bulletproof, mobile, and with serious hitting power. For these sort of targets, the infantry needs support weapons. One of the simplest of support weapons is the sniper originally known as a sharpshooter. The use of men armed with telescope-sided rifles using single, accurately placed shots over long ranges has been an important factor in combat since before the Civil War. Snipers have a variety of functions. Firing from carefully concealed positions at ranges of half a mile or more, they can be used to target enemy officers and NCOs, spreading uncertainty by removing the leaders of an advancing force. They can be used to pick off machine gun and mortar crews, depriving the enemy of infantry support. However, in modern armies, the sniper is more likely to be used as an observer than as a shooter, using his infiltration skills to penetrate enemy lines and report back on enemy strengths, movements, and positions. Two of the longest lasting infantry support weapons are the grenade and the mortar. These were developed after the gun. The first grenade soldiers, called grenadiers, were an elite force in the 18th century. As they advanced, these men lit the grenade's fuse and then threw it. At this time, grenades were crude, hollow spheres of metal or glass filled with gunpowder. The modern grenade is an explosive charge with a reliable safety and delay mechanism that allows a soldier to throw the grenade safely into an enemy trench or bunker. The US M2 hand grenade used in World War II in Korea was known to GIs as the pineapple grenade because of its distinctive cast iron serrated body. It had a spring-loaded striker held in place by a lever known as a spoon, that was in turn secured by a split pin with a ring attached. It weighed 21 ounces, of which two ounces were the flaked TNT charge. As long as the spoon was held down, the grenade was safe. But when it flew off and the striker hit the percussion cap, there was a delay of four to five seconds until the grenade exploded. It could be thrown 90 feet and had a lethal area of 30 feet. Here, a U.S. Marine hurls an M2 into a Japanese position on Iwo Jima in March 1945. It was in fighting against the Japanese that the improvised satchel charge was developed. This was a satchel filled with explosives and fitted with a pull switch and a length of fuse. Employing it like a giant hand grenade, the soldier operated the pull switch that ignited the safety fuse then hurled it into a cave mouth or through a bunker opening. Moments later, when the fuse had burned to the detonator, the charge exploded. Grenades were ideal weapons for fighting at night, where the flash from a rifle would give away the soldier's position. Sometimes after a thrown grenade landed, a soldier might have enough time to pick it up and throw it back. To avoid this, Soldiers often let the spoon fly off the grenade before it was thrown, 
and hoped that the delay mechanism was reliable. If grenades were launched from an adapted rifle, their range was extended. It was in the Vietnam War that this concept was developed into the M79 40mm grenade launcher. The weapon, known as the blooper, because of the distinctive sound it made when it fired, was like a large single-barreled shotgun. In the 10 years that it was in service, 350,000 were built and issued. It was replaced by the M203 that fired the same 40 millimeter ammunition, but it had the advantage in that it was mounted under the barrel of an M16 rifle. This Marine is firing an M203 fitted to a Colt M4 carbine, a modernized version of the M16, at the 29 Palms Marine Corps base in California. The 15-inch launcher weighs three pounds unloaded. A trained soldier can keep up a rate of fire of five to seven rounds a minute. At Ramstein Air Base in Germany, this U.S. Air Force Airman is going through dry training with a grenade launcher. This means training without using ammunition. Repetitive drills like this ensure that in the stress of a firefight, a soldier reacts automatically, loading, aiming and firing as a reflex. The effective aimed range of the 40 millimeter grenade fired from an M203 is 480 feet, but the maximum range against area targets, like a group of infantry, is 1,312 feet. The high explosive, or HE round, has an effective casualty radius of 15 feet. Among other types of ammunition that can be fired are red, yellow, white, and green smoke, CS riot control gas, and white and colored illumination rounds. Conventional hand grenades are not only produced with high explosive, that can be made with pyrotechnic fillings that produce clouds of smoke. This may be used to screen soldiers as they cross exposed ground, or to provide a clear visual signal to an aircraft or helicopter pilot. Colors will be agreed on in advance, so that when the soldiers on the ground pop smoke, the pilot knows he is not being deceived or drawn into a trap. Here at McCord Air Force Base in Washington State, a soldier marks a drop zone with high visibility colored cloth panels and green smoke grenades. He drops the grenade into a trash can to prevent it from causing a wildfire. For the crews of transport aircraft like the C-141B and C-130, the smoke not only marks the drop zone, but also gives an indication of the strength and direction of the wind on the ground. This is vital information for the dispatchers on the aircraft to ensure that the men and equipment they are dropping land close to the drop zone. If an instant smoke screen is required, the most effective grenade is one filled with white phosphorus, or WP. This chemical burns on contact with the air, producing a dense white cloud of smoke. Although designed to create smoke, WP grenades burn at a temperature of at least 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit and can be used as an incendiary device or as an anti-personnel weapon. At least five recipients of the Medal of Honor in World War II used white phosphorus grenades to clear enemy positions. Grenades can be used for simple booby traps as hidden explosive charges designed to kill or wound an unwary enemy soldier. With a weight placed on the spoon to keep it down and the pin removed, a grenade becomes a pressure-release triggered booby trap. The grenade can be secured to a stake and a fine wire attached to the ring. And if the wire is pulled or tripped, the pin is pulled free and the grenade explodes. Training with hand grenades can be intimidating for recruits. 
but it is essential that they become confident in handling them. Training grenades have the same safety features as real grenades. They weigh the same and contain a small charge that produces a harmless explosion. Recruits issued with these grenades can therefore use them safely in realistic tactical situations. It was in World War I that the modern mortar was developed, beginning with the British Stokes mortar. Named after its inventor, the Stokes was built in three calibers, three inch, four inch, and a big six inch. All had three major components, the barrel, base plate, and bipod. Artillery guns have rifled barrels, which gives shells a twist when they are fired in a shallow arc or trajectory. But most mortars have smooth bore barrels, so they throw bombs in a steep up and down trajectory. To prepare a mortar for firing, the base plate is placed on a firm level ground, and the closed end of the barrel is slotted into a ball socket in the base plate. The bipod is attached near the open muzzle end of the barrel. Once set up, the barrel points up at a high angle. As these men of the U.S. 322nd Infantry Regiment in training in Thailand show, the sights give bearing and elevation. This can be adjusted by repositioning the barrel. For fine adjustment, manual corrections change the traverse and elevation. Without ammunition to practice, the soldier from the 322nd simply says, boom, to show that a mortar bomb has been fired. Boom. To fire a mortar, a bomb is dropped down the barrel, where it hits the fixed firing pin that fires the primary charge in the base of the bomb. To increase the range, the barrel can be lowered to a shallower angle and extra explosive charges, called charge increments, are clipped onto the base of the bomb. There are three types of mortar, light, medium, and heavy. Light mortars are normally 60 millimeter caliber weapons deployed at platoon level. They provide local support with HE against dug-in enemies, as well as smoke to screen an attack and illuminating rounds at night. HE is effective against dug-in troops and men in the open. Where an area target has been located, like a base or barracks, an enemy mortar crew may walk bombs through the position by adjusting the elevation of the barrel or tube so that as each bomb is fired, the rounds fall along a line across the position. Mortar crews are normally given a number of defensive fire tasks. These are locations where the enemy may gather prior to or during an attack. They are given numbers or nicknames. These are transmitted over the radio. The crews can quickly adjust their mortars to ensure that a barrage falls in this location. There is also a final protective fire mission. This is normally targeted on the barbed wire in front of a force's own defended location. If a final protective fire mission is called, then it is a priority mission, since it means that the enemy is right in front of your own lines and the infantry is in real trouble. Smoke is normally provided with WP rounds. As with grenades, this can also be lethally effective against unprotected soldiers. It causes terrible burns and is lethal if the smoke is inhaled or fragments ingested. Lumps of WP sticking to a human cannot be extinguished until they are completely deprived of oxygen. For instance, plunging them completely into water. During the Normandy campaign following the D-Day landings in June 1944, 20% of U.S. Army 81 millimeter mortar rounds were WP. During the fighting to capture the French port of Cherbourg, a single U.S. mortar battalion 87th, fired 11,900 white phosphorus rounds into the city. A common practice is to fire a mixed barrage of HE and WP. Soldiers sometimes call this 
shake and bake, or mixed fruit. In fighting in Germany in 1945, this US 81 mm mortar platoon is firing a mixture of HE and WP. The WP bombs burst with a characteristic flash and cloud of white smoke, while HE explode with a gray-brown mixture of dirt and smoke. Illumination rounds use a combination of a very bright, slow-burning flare and a parachute. As the bomb starts to fall, the flare ignites and a parachute deploys to slow the descent. The flare will normally burn out by the time the bomb lands. A skilled mortar crew will time their firing so that one or more illumination rounds are in the sky, so that at no time is the battlefield dark. The attraction of illumination provided by mortars is that it is almost instantaneous, unlike the light from rockets, which is preceded by the sound of the rocket. The few seconds that precede the explosion of the rocket illumination give infantry time to take cover. With mortar rounds, all they can do is stand still and hope that they do not stand out against the terrain. The current U.S. Army M224 60mm light mortar weighs 46 and a half pounds with base plate and bipod, and 18 pounds in the light handheld mode. Its range is between 77 and 3,828 yards. With a three-man crew firing at a maximum rate, 18 to 30 bombs can be put into the air in a minute. The sustained rate is 8 to 20 rounds. It was developed in response to a requirement for replacement for the 60mm M2 mortar, a weapon that had seen wide service in World War II. The weapon was based on the French mortar of the same caliber built by the firm of Edgar Brandt. Firing a 3-pound HE bomb, it had a range of 100 to 1,985 yards. The M2 mortar on Mount M2 weighed 42 pounds in action. One very effective light mortar was the Japanese 50mm grenade discharger Type 10. The Allies called it the knee mortar because its curved base plate looked as though it was designed to be steadied on a kneeling operator's thigh. But if actually fired this way, the recoil would break the fire's leg. Medium mortars are in the 81mm caliber range. They are normally carried in vehicles but can be broken down and carried as three loads, barrel, bipod, and base plate. In World War II, the U.S. Army deployed the 81mm mortar M1. It had a minimum range of 100 yards, with a single small propulsive charge fitted to the tail end of the bomb, and a maximum range of 3,290 yards when a bomb was fitted with six charge increments. When the bomb slides down the barrel and hits the fixed firing pin, this charge explodes and pushes the bomb back up the barrel. Adding extra charge increments increases the power and range. The M43A1HE bomb weighed 6.87 pounds. In fighting at the close of the war in Europe, captured German 8.1 centimeter mortar bombs were fired at their original owners since the calibers were compatible. The German weapon had a maximum range of 2,625 yards, fitted with five charge increments, and a minimum range of 65.5 yards. The German bombs at 7.72 pounds were heavier than the US M43A1. The US 4.2 inch chemical mortar seen here firing air burst bombs against the Japanese in the Philippines, had a rifled barrel and was developed after World War I to fire gas and smoke bombs. In World War II, it was used to fire smoke and HE to a maximum range of 4,400 yards.
The heavy mortar is a weapon of 120 to 155 millimeter caliber. It is less of an infantry support weapon and more a part of the artillery. In World War II, U.S. technical intelligence experts had the opportunity to evaluate a captured Japanese 150 millimeter mortar type 97. Introduced into service in 1937, this big mortar fired a 57-pound bomb to a maximum range of 2,187 yards. It featured significantly in the defense of the Pacific Islands, and the Japanese even mounted some on small boats for coastal defense. In terms of the weight of fire it can bring to bear on the enemy, the heavy mortar is closer to field artillery in terms of its overall capability. However, it retains a good level of mobility. All mortars have a high trajectory, which means they can launch bombs over features like hills, tree lines, or buildings against an enemy concealed from direct fire. This means they can also be fired from woods or jungle where there is a gap in the tree cover. However, care has to be taken to ensure that there are no branches that might be clipped by the bomb on its upward flight which could cause a premature explosion and lethal air burst above the mortar crew. A weapons pit and bunker like this one in Bosnia for an M224 lightweight mortar can be dug to give the crew overhead cover and a protected position. Few settings can be adjusted so that the bomb explodes in the air, showering fragments on troops in the open. A fuse delay will cause the bomb to penetrate deep into the ground before it explodes. The delay setting is very effective against dug-in troops since the bomb can punch through bunker roofs. With a mortar fire controller and a concealed observation post with a radio or field telephone link to the mortar line, very accurate fire can be delivered. In World War II, mortar officers had simple tools like a compass and binoculars to observe a target and correct fire. Today, mortar fire controllers like these men of the 82nd Airborne Division in Afghanistan use sophisticated equipment like night vision equipment and laser rangefinders and handheld computers to give a high level of accuracy. Equipment developed at the end of World War II used active infrared light to illuminate a target. This produced a beam of light invisible to the naked eye but visible to someone with an infrared detector. A passive system called Image Intensification, or II, came next. It uses existing light, for example, from the moon and stars, and amplifies it. This produces a clear but green picture. II has been improved. On this range, where there is a powerful light from a 60 millimeter illumination round, II is not overloaded and doesn't cause the screen to go blank. The night vision image of these men of the 82nd Airborne Division shows a sophisticated II image that can adjust to the strong light from an M83 illumination round fired from a 60 millimeter mortar during operations in Afghanistan. The rounds are fired to give soldiers in a watchtower illumination so that they can observe the terrain. During the mission, illumination rounds are made ready and fired. The mortar sights are adjusted after the base plate has settled into the ground or bedded in from the recoil of the first round. Finally, thermal imaging produces a picture of the heat patterns generated by soldiers and their equipment. It is very sensitive and allows the operator to see night and day detecting the heat generated by people and objects hidden from the naked eye by camouflage netting and vegetation. The Imperial German Army tested flamethrowers in 1911 and was the first to use them in World War I. Even though the range was only 25 yards and the equipment was bulky, they terrified the men on the receiving end. New fuels, lighter materials, and more reliable pressurization meant that man-portable flamethrowers
became a very effective infantry support weapon. A flamethrower could be used to burn down buildings or vegetation, but it was lethally effective against enemy bunkers. The blazing fuel consumed the oxygen inside the bunker, so the soldiers inside suffocated. Flamethrower operators also employed wet and dry shot tactics. Covered by fire from an infantry squad, they got close enough to the bunker to squirt unignited fuel through the opening. A wet shot. With the inside soaked with fuel, they followed with a dry shot, a burst of burning fuel. Men inside a bunker hit with a wet shot often surrendered because they knew what was coming next. Here at the close of the war in the Pacific, Australian soldiers equipped with a US supplied M22 flamethrower attacked buildings suspected of concealing Japanese. The M22 operator carried the 72 pound flamethrower with its four gallons of fuel on a pack frame while his number two was in position to open the fuel valves and also carry extra fuel, tools, and personal weapons. The weapon had a range of 25 to 40 yards with bursts of eight to nine seconds. Research on the battlefield had shown that a big flame was more intimidating to enemy infantry than a thin stream of burning liquid. So napalm-based fuels were developed that were thicker and stickier. Tank-mounted flamethrowers were an invaluable support for the infantry since they could carry more fuel projected over longer ranges and were invulnerable to small arms fire and mortar fragments. M4 Sherman tanks modified as flamethrowers saw action in the Pacific against Japanese who were prepared to die fighting in bunkers and fortified caves rather than surrender. Landmines have been used in warfare for centuries, but the modern mine is a product of the First World War. Mines are essentially defensive weapons. They can be used to protect infantry positions and to deny an enemy the ability to occupy key points. They are used to channel an attacking enemy into kill zones where they can be engaged and destroyed by friendly forces. Traditionally, Mines were laid by hand, but modern versions can be delivered by helicopter or artillery, allowing fields to be laid at short notice in front of an advancing enemy. Larger mines are designed to destroy or disable tanks. In some battles in North Africa and on the Eastern Front in World War II, mines accounted for half of all armored vehicles destroyed. Smaller weapons, known as anti-personnel mines, are designed to injure or kill individuals. Most recently, mines have been the weapon of choice of terrorists and guerrilla fighters. Using improvised explosive devices and triggered directly by wire, they are a constant threat to organized armed forces around the world. Often in battle, soldiers find new uses for weapons developed and deployed for another role. The most dramatic example of this is the use of recoilless man-portable anti-tank weapons against bunkers and buildings. Used in this role, the infantry brought artillery caliber weapons right into the front line. There are two types of recoilless weapon, those that fire a rocket, which are called rocket launchers, and those that fire a shell but vent the gases to the rear to release recoil energy which are called recoilless rifles. The U.S. Army M18 57mm recoilless rifle developed during World War II was just over five feet long and weighed 45 pounds unloaded. 
It had a maximum range of 4,000 yards, but a realistic range was about 150 yards against a moving target and 300 yards against bunkers. The M18 could be carried by one man on his shoulder or strapped to a pack frame. It could be fired from the shoulder or mounted on a modified M1917 A1 machine gun tripod for greater stability and accuracy when used with the Times 2.8 magnification telescopic sight. At the beginning of the war, the idea that a man could fire such a powerful weapon off his shoulder, almost like a rifle, was inconceivable. However, working on captured German technology, the Americans came up with a remarkable weapon that was used for many years. It could fire high explosive anti-tank, canister, HE and WP ammunition, which made it a useful weapon for frontline infantry. The only drawback was the back blast, which can be seen in the firing of the M1 Garand rifle in this U.S. Army training film. Dust is kicked up by the blast of the recoilless rifle, since it had a muzzle velocity of 1,220 feet per second. The crew had to ensure that they were to the side of the weapon when it fired, and that there were no obstructions like walls close to the breech that could reflect the blast. As the training film shows, the M18 57mm recoilless rifle was effective against bunker emplacements as well as tanks. The flat trajectory made it ideal against small or point targets like the openings of bunkers where the internal explosion would kill or injure the enemy and wreck their weapons. The success of the M18 led to the development of the bigger 75mm M20 with a range of 7,000 yards. U.S. Marines in Okinawa, as well as in Korea, used the M18 until it was replaced by the more effective 3.5-inch M20 Super Bazooka. The U.S. Army developed a new recoilless rifle, the 105mm M27, fielded in 1952. The M27 design was unsatisfactory and was replaced with the 106mm M40 by the early 60s. The small difference in bore made it possible to use the M27 ammunition in the M40. The M40A1 and M40A2 recoilless rifles succeeded the M40 and were used extensively by the USMC in Vietnam. The World War II U.S. Army 2.36-inch rocket launcher, better known by the GIs as the Bazooka, seen here in action in Iwo Jima in 1945, was a classic example of this type of weapon. Because it was a rocket launcher, there was no recoil because the energy that propelled the 3.4-pound projectile out of the barrel came from its own internal rocket motor. It had a maximum range of 700 yards and could penetrate 4.7 inches of armor. Because there was no heavy recoil and only the hot gases from the rocket motor venting from the open end of the launcher, the weapon could be light, only 13.25 pounds. During World War II, some 476,628 bazookas were made, along with 15,603,000 rockets. During the fighting in the Ardennes in 1944-45, individual U.S. soldiers armed with bazookas won the Medal of Honor in heroic actions against German tanks. During the Vietnam War, the M72 66mm lightweight anti-armor weapon, or LAW, was introduced. Soldiers found that this one-shot rocket launcher was easy to carry. They could toss it after it fired, and it had an effective range of over 200 meters. It was a superb bunker buster, even though it was originally designed as an anti-tank weapon. As tank armor has been updated and improved, so too as the concept of the one-shot man-portable anti-tank weapon. The use of alloys for components has made these weapons very light, 
a soldier can sling one over his shoulder and carry it along with his combat equipment. Today, the U.S. Army fields the M136, a one-shot weapon designed and developed as the AT-4 LAW by the famous Swedish defense company of Bofors. The barrel is made from glass-reinforced plastic with a cone-shaped aluminum vent at the rear. This 94-millimeter caliber weapon fires a six-pound projectile that can penetrate over 420 millimeters of armor at an effective range of 300 yards. The fuse has been designed to explode even if the round hits the target at a shallow angle. Variants of this weapon developed by Bofors include the light multi-purpose assault weapon designed for use in fighting in built-up areas and the AT-4CS or confined space version that can be fired from rooms or bunkers. The ATHP or high penetration version will punch through 600 millimeters of armor and a tandem warhead version, the AT-4HPT, uses two charges to defeat tanks protected by explosive reactive armor. The M136 has been used in action in Iraq and Afghanistan. Infantry support weapons have come a long way from the grenadiers of the 18th century battlefield. Infantry battalion weapons like mortars and anti-tank missiles allow soldiers to capture or hold ground without calling in the heavyweight firepower of artillery or the bombs and rockets of ground attack aircraft. It is the imaginative use of infantry support weapons that reveals the truly gifted infantry commander. Now, a new generation of guided weapons will allow soldiers to fire and forget, as the radar and computer in the nose of a mortar round or missile guides the projectile to the target. <laughs>